now we can move on to continuous domain. We are still doing policy optimization. For policy gradient methods, this is just a quick recap. You have an advantage estimator, then you're gonna do policy gradient. This is an approximation to the gradient of your expected future rewards. This is what this gradient is, this term, G hat. Policy is where you're putting your policy network. And then this guy, you're gonna do Monte Carlo on a finite batch of samples. And as soon as you know your gradient, you're gonna be able to update your policy. But you're not gonna encode up your gradients in modern softwares, modern frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow. What you're gonna model is you're gonna write down your, a loss and then, the, and then TensorFlow is gonna take the gradients for you. So you are only gonna write down your loss function. And this is your loss function based on that gradient. So this is our loss function. We covered PRPO, Trust Region Policy Optimization. A quick recap of that. We know that there is theoretical reasons for the KL divergence to showing up. But in the end, if you look at the Trust Region method, and if you ignore this KL divergence, what you have up there, it's very similar to what you have. If you take the gradient of this objective with respect to theta, you are gonna get the gradient of this pi of theta divided by pi old. And what is the gradient here? The gradient of the log is the gradient of pi divided by pi. So the only difference is that you're putting a pi old here rather than the new pi. So in terms of objective, it's very similar to before. As soon as you take gradients, these gradients are gonna be very similar to each other. Assuming that you didn't change much, you didn't change your pi old, you didn't change too much compared to your pi old. And that's why you have these KL divergions so that you don't change too much with respect to pi old. So is this point clear? It's clear that the, um, the gradients are gonna be similar. Is it um, being done for some good reason? Uh, for good reason, the good reason is that we went through the trust region policy optimization algorithm. And this is an objective that we came up with. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, what, why am I going through this? Because these two are actually very similar. We came at them from two different perspectives, but they're actually very similar to each other, okay? So they, there is good reason for doing trust region policy optimization. And we saw that. There is theoretical reasons for doing it. We went through this paper. And if you remember, we did linear approximation to the objective, quadratic approximation to the constraint, and then we used conjugate gradient algorithm to optimize that. So this we saw before. You can rewrite that in terms of a penalty. You take your constraint and put it as a penalty in your objective, or you can actually get rid of that and get rid of this beta and look at this term. This is gonna be called, uh, and then what we are gonna do is go through clipped surrogate objective. But let's reformulate the objective here. If you rename that and let that to be RT of theta, so I'm just renaming this guy, it's new notation, and this is just the probability ratio. If you're located at theta old, your ratio is gonna be one. So all we want to do is we don't want to deviate too much from pi old, that's the whole objective here. If you do only CPI, and CPI stands for conservative policy iteration, you're gonna get rid of this beta and then you're gonna optimize this objective. But we know that there is no guarantee for R of T of theta to be close to one, because that's what we want. We want this guy to be close to one. We want these guys to be similar to each other. We don't want to deviate too much from the old policy. This is gonna deviate. There is nothing stopping it. The idea of PPO, proximal policy optimization, is to enforce this to be close to one. And we're gonna see how, this is really smart. What are you gonna do? If your R of T of theta during training falls above one plus epsilon or below one minus epsilon, clip it. Just set it to be one plus epsilon or one minus epsilon. This way you are removing the incentive for R to be, to be moving outside of the interval one minus delta and one plus delta because as soon as it moves out, you're not gonna see it. So your gradients are not gonna get updated. So you're gonna kill this term and you're gonna focus only on A. But there is also another catch. What you're gonna do, why are you taking this minimum? Remember, in the end, you're solving a maximization problem. Whatever L clip is, it's gonna be bigger than or equal to the CPI, 
loss that we just saw, the CPI objective, it's going to be bigger than or equal to this guy, and also bigger than or equal to this clip term times your AT. So it's going to be bigger than or equal to 1 plus epsilon AT, 1 minus epsilon AT, all of those terms. So it's just a pessimistic lower bound for that objective. If you maximize this, you are maximizing this term. At the same time, you are removing the incentive for your R to be far away from 1. So this is really smart. You're first clipping it and then putting a pessimistic lower bound on the actual objective function that you care about. But not only you do that, there could be multiple other parts of your objective. One, the main one is this clip. The other one is you have a value function that you want it to match your target value. Why do you need this? Because in your advantage, this uh, V of theta is gonna show up. So you're gonna do a regression on that. At the same time, you want to encourage exploration through entropy maximization. And remember, this term you are maximizing, this term you are maximizing, and because of this negative sign, you are minimizing the mean squared error between the actual target uh, value and your neural network. But what is your advantage? Uh, this we saw before, that because you're gonna receive rewards that are sparse, not only you can look at only one reward, but you can look at some other rewards into the future. And this term minus this term is gonna give you your advantage. And this is exactly where V of theta is coming in. You can make that estimate, this estimate that you have here for your advantage because of these summations has a huge variance. So it's gonna have a high variance, but it's gonna be uh, of less bias. It has very little bias, but higher variance. You can go to the extreme, you can rewrite this formula using the telescope rule and write everything in terms of the deviation of RT plus gamma V of ST plus one minus V. You can write it in terms of your delta and you're just looking one step into the future. So this I'm gonna leave as an exercise of how you can do it. This is true when lambda is one. As soon as lambda is one, these two are equivalent. But why are you introducing lambda here? Because if lambda is zero, you're only taking a look at this guy. This is gonna have, this is gonna be a very bad estimate. It's gonna have high bias. It's gonna be a biased estimate, but then it's gonna have lower variance. By introducing this lambda here, which could go from zero to one, we can span the entire spectrum and balance the trade-off between bias and variance. So this is gonna give you a better estimate for your advantage. And in terms of the algorithm, I just explained everything. There is no reason to go into more details. You run your old policy in your environment, you compute your advantage estimates, and then as soon as you compute them, you can write down your loss function. So the main contribution is here. The way that you remove the incentive for moving outside of the interval from one minus delta, one minus epsilon to one plus epsilon. And the reason for doing this is because we want R to be close to one and R we want it to be close to one because we don't want to deviate too much from the old policy. Any questions?